But of the day, uh, we're going to cut things a little bit short. Section 11 1, there really isn't very much going on. You'll probably find chapter 11 to be a lot more chill than the uh, other chapters. That's pretty common practice in college classes, actually. They're not always the same week, but uh, they're usually pretty close together. <laughs> okay, so, uh, yeah, apparently tomorrow is the deadline to switch to a pass, no pass assessment in class, which is a very strange day to have a deadline on Thursday. Um, I'm going to try to get these graded as soon as possible. Uh, I have a pretty busy day today, so I honestly don't even know if I'll have it done by the time I go to bed, but I will try to get those grades posted before I go to bed for that reason. <coughs> so, chapter 11 deals with conic sections. And to understand conic sections and why they're called conic sections, you have to visualize two cones. So, you know, you can think of traffic cones or whatever, and uh, imagine them connected vertex to vertex. So you're going to have one cone like this, and another cone like this. Something like an hourglass, although hourglasses aren't usually quite conical. So, you have these attached cones, and a conic section is what results when you slice this figure. When a, a plane intersects this figure, the cross section is what we call a conic section. Now, a plane can intersect this figure in a variety of orientations, and the angle of intersection is going to determine exactly which conic section we're talking about. So if you imagine a plane passing through that is parallel to the bases of the cones, the resulting cross-section will be a circle. If a plane passes through at exactly this angle, it's going to produce a circular cross-section. On the other hand, if a plane passes through slightly off that angle, say at an angle like this, the resulting cross-section will be an ellipse. So circles and ellipses are conic sections. And as that angle gets steeper and steeper, you get closer and closer to a degenerate conic section. In particular, if it slices through tangent to the cones. So if the plane slices at exactly this angle, just brushing the cones effectively, that conic section is a line. Technically, a line is a conic section. But then the plane may be tilted further. You can have a plane passing through at an angle like this, for example. I'm going to draw another figure that's getting kind of busy. So is the conic section the figure or the lines? The conic section is the cross section that results. So if I have these cones, and we'll imagine that their bases are parallel, and I have a plane slicing at this angle, it's going to result in a curve something like this, and then up here a curve something like this. Such a curve would be called a hyperbola. I'll get to those tomorrow. You've probably seen them before. I think I mentioned one in class uh, last week. Bill? 
Didn't we have, uh, wasn't it like sign graphs that we were doing that had hyperbolas? Confusing well, they don't actually have hyperbolas. Uh, there was a, another situation where hyperbola resulted, and we looked at the intersection, I think. But um, sure, the transformations are not for like a sine function or cross sine hyperbola. Right, right. So, if you look at a cosecant function, for example, it looks a little bit like an offset hyperbola, but it's not actually an offset hyperbola. That's the other thing is a lot of these graphs, to a casual inspection, are very, very similar to each other. And you may not be able to tell the difference between, for example, if you take a parabola and reflect it to create another arc, that may look like a hyperbola to you, but it's not a hyperbola. They don't really have the same shape. Speaking of a parabola, that's also a conic section. Imagine a plane slicing at this orientation. It's going to produce a parabola. So we have. Circles, ellipses, lines, hyperbolas, and parabolas. Those are all conic sections. They're also all of the types of graphs that can be created by equations that are quadratic in two variables. Again, the degenerate case is the line where the quadratic terms all have a coefficient of zero and therefore disappear. But they can still be considered quadratic equations. If it's not degenerate. In other words, if at least one of the quadratic terms has a non-zero coefficient, then you end up with one of the other conic sections. A circle, an ellipse, a parabola, a hyperbola. So the first thing I want to talk about is how you can easily distinguish between them. It should be apparent immediately from looking at a quadratic equation in two variables, whether you're looking at a circle, an ellipse, a parabola, or a hyperbola. And if you're looking at anything other than a circle, how it's oriented. Circles don't really have orientation because they're the same in all directions. So what type of conic section is this graph going to be? Parabola. That's a parabola. You've worked with them before. Uh, the parabolas are the only conic section that can be a function. The others, it's impossible for them to be functions. That's why you haven't seen them as much. But uh, this is certainly a parabola. It's a parabola with vertical symmetry. You know whether it has vertical or horizontal symmetry based on which of the variables is squared. Consider, for example, the equation x equals y squared. What would you expect such a graph to look like? Symmetrical. Mm -hmm. This is also a parabola, but it has horizontal symmetry. Now, of course, the vertical symmetry is a lot more familiar to us because that's the whole function idea. We're used to the idea of y being a function of x. Vertical symmetry makes sense there. <coughs> Horizontal symmetry does not. But in terms of a parabola, in terms of conic section, these have the same properties. It's just that one of them is you know, going to be centered around the x-axis and one of them centered around the y-axis. So those are parabolas. Yeah? Uh, I'm confused. What is the difference between a, a parabola with horizontal symmetry and a hyperbola? Well, that's the thing. Um, first of all, a parabola only has one arc. A parabola has two arcs. So that's visually the most immediate difference. Furthermore, they don't have the same properties, even though they do resemble each other visually. Uh, a parabola is not just any arc that, that curves like this. Uh, in order to be a parabola, it has to have particular curvature in particular positions. And um, again, a casual inspection would probably not tell you which was which. If I just said, you know, look at this graph here, and said, okay, is that a hyperbola or is it a parabola that's going to reflect it so it's doubled up? Visually speaking, I wouldn't be able to tell. I would need to be able to, to compare some points and, and look at the equation. But they, they're not actually the same thing. Just like the... Uh, Parabola. 
<laughs> so that's exactly the question you asked. <laughs> oh, is it? Word for word. Wait, really? Yes. Okay. So, this is the graph of a harmonic function. It resembles a hyperbola, but it's not actually a hyperbola. Likewise, it sort of resembles a parabola that's been doubled around, but it's not actually a parabola either. Part of the difference is the hyperbolas and likewise the harmonic functions, they do have asymptotes. Parabolas don't have asymptotes. So it's not, it's not a real clear cut obvious visual difference, but they, uh, they're not the same thing. So those are parabolas. They can easily be distinguished from the other conic sections because they only have one quadratic variable. Here, the x is squared, here the y is squared, but not both. So that's an indicator that we're talking about a parabola and not one of the others. Now, if they're both squared, you might have a circumstance that looks like this. Where a, b, and c can be any positive numbers. They can be, you know, rational, irrational, whatever, but they can't be negative. If either of them are negative, we're looking at a different scenario that I get to in a moment. This is an ellipse. I'll talk in those, uh, more detail about those tomorrow. Now, it strongly resembles another conic section that you're a little more familiar with. What else does that look like? A circle. It's very close to what you think of when you think of a circle. But it has a very important difference. Or I should say, rather, a circle is a special case. For this to be a circle, what else has to be true? A, and B. a and B must be the same number. If A and B happen to be the same, the eccentricity of the ellipse goes to zero, and you have a circle. I'll talk more about eccentricity tomorrow as well. Oh, okay. hmm? So does, does the like dimensions of the cone ever change? What do you mean? Well, like, are we always going to have like the same size cones that we're going to be working on? The size doesn't really matter <coughs> for our purposes. Hmm? As I completed earlier, um, is the graph called a, a harmonic function graph, or does that have a name? The one that's 1 over x? Uh, uh, f of x equals 1 over x is the harmonic function. It's the graph just called a function. Yeah. It's, it's also a rational function, but it's a very specific one. Okay. The shape behavior, the two cones, why, why are these important? Uh, because that's just where the name comes from. All of these figures are referred to as conic sections, because you can produce them by sectioning cones. But that's really the only reason that's relevant. We're not, we're not going to work with these at all. So we're just doing this to represent that we can find anything from all. Right, that's sort of what unifies these objects. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it's not relevant to our work. It's just uh, that's the reason why they're all lumped together. Kind of like a map of quadratic functions. Something like that. So there is the other scenario. As I said, for the ellipse, A, B, and C must all be positive. But there's also the case where they're not all positive. And that's the hyperbola. Now, whether A is positive and B is negative, or A is negative and B is positive, that has nothing to do with whether it's a hyperbola or not. So in other words, uh, AY squared minus BX squared equals C is also hyperbola. It's an orientation question. Now I'll talk about hyperbolas tomorrow, and, and we'll get into that a little more. So these are all for tomorrow. Today I'm just going to talk about parabolas, and there isn't a whole lot to say about them. Especially because we're not going to go off of the origin today. That'll be next week we'll go off the origin. And so, since we're staying on the origin, things will be nice and simple. But, you do want to bear in mind the whole, if one of them is squared, that's a parabola. If they're both squared, they both have the same sign, that's an ellipse, or perhaps a circle. If they're both squared and they have different signs, that's a hyperbola. That's how you want to categorize them. Okay, so what about parabolas? We'll talk about those. So 
So again, we're going to have two types of parabolas, either y equals ax squared or x equals uh, ay squared. It's true that there are other, you know, elements that can be involved. I mean, you might have ax squared plus bx plus c. Like I said, we're not going to get into shifted parabolas today. That's next week. So, the form that we're actually going to work with these in is this form here. Because, and here's kind of gets into a little bit more why parabolas and hyperbolas aren't the same thing. Conic sections are also typical in that they all have something called a focus. Sometimes they have two foci. Depends on the particular graph we're working with. Uh, parabolas have one focus. Now you're familiar with the vertex of a parabola, but the focus is something you might not have worked with quite as much. So here's what the graph of this vertical symmetry parabola looks like. Now the sides of a parabola get very steep, and they get steeper and steeper as you go out. For that reason, they may give the appearance that there's an asymptote that they approach. There is no asymptote. The curve continues to expand forever. It just rises faster and faster. So as a result, the properties of a parabola are pretty simple. For one thing, you have the vertex, as you're familiar with. <coughs> Where is the vertex of this parabola? Zero. 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 We'll look at shifted parabolas uh, next week, but for now they're all going to vertex zero, zero, so I'll make that easy. A parabola also has a point in the interior. That's the focus. There are also two lines that sort of frame a parabola. The first is the axis of symmetry. The axis of symmetry passes through the vertex, and the parabola is symmetric about the axis of symmetry. So a parabola of this form, the axis of symmetry will always be x equals 0. It's pretty straightforward. Of course, a uh, horizontal symmetry uh, parabola is going to have an axis of symmetry of y equals 0. Same idea, but I'll look at those in a minute. The other line that is of interest to us is called the directrix. The directrix is perpendicular to the axis of symmetry. It is sort of in the exterior of the parabola. And in fact, the distance from the vertex to the focus is the same as the distance from the vertex to the directrix. That distance is represented by the letter P. And that's why we write it as x squared equals 4PY rather than just x squared equals AY because if it's 4PY, then P will be the, uh, the distance from the vertex to the focus and likewise the distance from the vertex to the directrix. So, if you have the parabola in this form, identifying the focus isn't terribly difficult. If, for example, we have a parabola x squared equals 8y, it follows that p equals what? Zero. zero. Well, no, not zero. Well, sorry. <laughs> no, I, I just got one. Two. Two. Four P equals eight. Two times four is eight. Wow, really? 
Yeah, there's really not a lot going on with parabolas unless they're shifted, which we'll talk about next week. If the parabola's not shifted, the vertex is at the origin, it's really that simple. There's really nothing else to it. So, in this case, the vertex is 0, 0, because like I said, it's not shifted. Where's the focus? Zero two. Once you know what P is, you just offset from the vertex by that much, and there's your focus. Now we know it's zero two and not two zero because of the orientation of the parabola. Hmm? Um, do you mind explaining how P is two? Well, <coughs> this is the general equation. <coughs> So if I'm looking at this equation, it follows that 8 is equal to 4p. Oh, okay. So we go, okay, we go based on that equation. <coughs> so we would need either the general equation and the graph, or the general equation and uh, yeah, x squared equals 8y to figure out what p is, right? Uh, well, yes, you should know the general equation in the same way that you would know the general equation of the circle or whatever. That way, if I give you this, you should be able to find out the focus just from this. How would you know if it shifted on the x-axis before shifting? Shifting is something I'll deal with next week. For now, there's no shift. The vertex is always going to be zero, zero. Is the focus like tied to the vertex? Yeah. Oh. The focus, focus is just offset from the vertex okay. along the axis of symmetry. So what is the focus? What is the focus? What does it represent? I'll get to that in a moment. Um, so the focus value is there if it's oriented this, this way, if it's a vertical symmetry of a parabola, then yes, the focus is just going to be shifted in the y direction. But if it's say like x is equal to y squared. Exactly, then the focus would drift horizontally instead. And then the y should be determined based on like the axis symmetry. Everything works exactly the same way you just transpose the vertex. Got it. So what about the directrix here? Zero negative. Zero negative two. Well, not exactly. The directrix certainly passes through zero and negative two, but the directrix isn't a point. So y, y equals negative two. That's how you can express the directrix. So none of it's difficult in terms of calculations, but you have to think about it a little bit. Drawing a picture is certainly not a bad idea because that way you can visualize <coughs> what you're working with. So we're not going to both have to compensate. No, okay. not in this class. Maybe in another. Because that's why we call these conic sections. Otherwise, that wouldn't be perfect. So consider y squared equals uh, x over. This is a parabola. Because y is squared, x is not. That always tells you we're looking at a parabola. One of the variables is squared, the other is not. If I graph it, what would it look like, yeah. roughly speaking? Like a bulge. Hmm? Like a bulge. Very Wouldn't wide. that look like a bulge? No, because it'd be this much wider. Yeah, it it's not going to look like that, though. Yeah, it'd be wider than that. It'd be <laughs> That's not the only difference. <laughs> much bigger difference is that this is horizontally symmetric. Yeah, but much wider. <laughs> <laughs> That's a scaling issue. I mean, you can you can handle that by how wide how widely you space your tick marks. But uh, I was just trying to get at the point that this one is sort of on its side. That's the really important issue here. So, if I wanted to find out the focus, etc., the vertex is still going to be zero zero. We have to move. But if I want to find out where the focus and the direction, actually, before you do that, let's talk about the axis of symmetry real quick. I don't need to do that uh, to figure out the axis of symmetry. What would be the axis of symmetry? X equals zero. Uh, y equals zero. Y equals zero. Okay. In order to figure out the focus and the directrix, what would I have to do? Uh, I'm going to figure it out P. Yeah. 
So I can write this as y squared equals 4px, just like that one with variables transposed. So if I have y squared equals, you know, 1 third x is the same as 4px, it follows that 4p is equal to 1 third. To find out p, I have to multiply by 1 fourth on both sides and find that p is 1 twelfth. After you do three or four of these, it's really very simple. It's just basically you're multiplying whatever the coefficient is by one fourth. That tells you what p is. So, where's the focus going to be? Isn't it usually one? It's going to be at one twelfth zero. One twelfth zero. Yeah. So it's supposed. To, um, isn't it supposed to be that shouldn't the three go onto the other side? I'm not trying to find out. X is a variable. Right, but isn't that how you get it into the original um, form of the thing? So you get like 3y squared equals x, and then you move on from there? Yeah, but that's still not going to get me where I need to be. I can't get p that way. Hmm. Right. Because p has to be in this form. So if I have a coefficient on y squared, that's just making things harder. I need to keep y squared by itself. Oh, no. Okay, I see. I see. Thanks. Yeah. So? If it's like kind of related to the other graph, could the dietrix thing be x equals negative 1 12? That's correct. Mm -hmm. So the focus is at 1 12, 0. And the directrix. <coughs> is that x equals negative 1 12. Thanks. So 4p is, is separate from 2x? 4p is the coefficient. Okay. Yeah. But for any particular parabola, p is fixed. x is a variable. If P is different, then you're looking at a different parabola. Mm -hmm. I don't know if P stands for parabola. I kind of doubt it. But anyway, P is a letter we use. So, given the equation of a parabola, you should be able to determine the directrix and the focus. That's basically how that's done. So, do we need to like draw out like the di directrix thing? Uh, only if you ask the graphic. This is a function, right? Correct. Well, it's not a, in this graph, y is not a function of x. It is true that x is a function of y, but that's not usually how that term is used. Focal parameter. Focal parameter. So I guess p is the parameter in this case. So if it's not a function of so what are we graphing? How we say it? Because we are graphing what? We're well, graphing that equation. This curve. <coughs> is the set of all solutions to this equation. So that's the solution set. In the same way that all other graphs are solution sets, it's true that this doesn't have the property that is often our focus. Namely, it's not y as a function of x. But other than that, it still has all the other properties. So what is a focus anyway? Why is a focus important? Well, it has to do with deflection. If you have a curve in the shape of a parabola, and the focus is here, any trajectory from this focus onto that parabolic arc is going to be deflected out into a parallel trajectory. Anybody drive a car? Drive a car? 
You ever turn on the headlights? Yes, I thought so. That's a headlight. Oh. The bulb in the headlight of your car faces inward. The light hits the parabolic dish of your headlamp reflector and reflects outward so that all of the light goes in the same direction. As a result, the headlamp, even though light radiates in all directions, the headlamp deflects that light into a single direction. Optical glasses work the same way, right? A lot of optics work the same way. Flashlights. Flashlights, same idea. Question. The eyeball itself? Uh, that's a little more complicated. It's reflecting an image. It's not reflecting an image like flipping it as well. Right. The, the issue with the, the, the uh, pupil of your eye is it's what you call a camera obscura where photons from the outside world enter the pupil of your eye and are received by the rods and cones on the inside. They're received backwards and upside down because of the angles that the light enters your eye. Uh, but then your brain processes so you can see it as if it were not backwards and upside down. But um, I'm not familiar with the arrangement of rods and cones inside the eye enough to know if they're arranged that way. I do know that if you have a satellite antenna, the same idea works in reverse, where any light entering the satellite dish at any angle is deflected directly into the actual satellite receiver, which is that little thing that floats off in front. So that's why parabolic shapes are useful, is because they can, they can manage that deflection. Light doesn't enter a surface in a neat way. It enters it from all directions. Likewise, if you have a light bulb, the bulb is going to emit light in all directions simultaneously. But that's not useful to you. The light that passes backwards in your direction is not helpful. You want the light to be you know, aiming forward. And this parabolic dish is what makes sure that it all uh, happens in a fairly neat way. You know how like um, projectors that have a lens, does that apply the same? Like this projector here, for example? Yeah. Just well, you will notice that the projection lens is slightly arced. It is a curved surface. It's not perfectly flat. Again, a lot of things with optics, you have to manage the deflection angles for the, the photons. Same sort of idea. I don't know the exact nature of the curvature of that lens. I don't know if it's parabolic or elliptical. I'm not sure exactly how it's supposed to work. But it does have to do with how your sending light from a very small source onto a much larger surface and you want it to have the same orientation and everything looking like it's all at the right angles. So if the uh, focus has this purpose of finding parallel deflections from a certain point, what purpose does the directrix have? The directrix have? The directrix is one of the properties of a curve. So, well, the directrix is kind of behind the parabola and therefore not really doing anything. The parabola has a directrix. So it's just one of the ways that the parabola is categorized. So it's just another way of defining a parabola? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So all that you're going to be asked to do basically is to identify the foci and directrices of parabolas. Which, again, if they're not shifted, is really, really simple. It's just a matter of finding P and then offsetting P in either direction to find the focus in one direction, the directrix in the other. And that's really all there is with this section. So, um, I've assigned some homework, and uh, shouldn't, shouldn't be anything too difficult. Uh, that's going to be for tomorrow. So, actually, let's just have a look at some questions. I'm just going to pull up the homework here. Before I jump into this, uh, we're going to a new web assigned class. Let me give you the class key for that. This will take us through the end of next week, so this will be the last one. So we're going to section Aleph now. Yeah, I, I don't really know how how likely web assigned is to be paying attention to what I'm doing, but. And the off chance that A and B were too obvious. 
I called, uh, I don't even really care. Um, oh, what's this one? This is the money we're talking yeah, about. Of course they care. Classes, though. Yeah, but they, they, they see the, the classics like created. Well, it's not like they're going to have a person watching, but they might have a program scraping. With how bad they're like programming the US about it. <laughs> you don't understand how corporations work. Of course they don't care about anything that's gonna benefit us. But when it's their money, you best believe they do care. Just ask Netflix. <coughs> how much work do you think it took them to figure out if people were sharing passwords? It wasn't something they could do just by asking. So they wrote a program to catch people because that's their money. Oh, I need to, like, the end date's, like, really far out. Um, yeah. Are you going to kick this out, like, after the class is done? Oh, well, that's just... <laughs> <laughs> like, well, we I mean, your trial's going to expire, so it's not going to matter, unless you paid for the full access, in which case, knock yourself out. I mean, uh, How do we have to finish all of them? Uh, well, the final exam is Friday. I'll grade them on Saturday, and I'll start inputting your grades on Sunday. So, as long as it's done before Sunday, you're good. I can't wait any longer than that because the fall semester starts on Monday. <laughs> Speaking of which, I had some good news. I am teaching calculus in the fall. Oh, I very excited for you. Yeah, um, there were some shenanigans that uh, don't uh, don't concern y'all, but I'm very very happy to have the class. I was, I mean, yeah, it was basically a miracle. I actually started dancing when I. Uh, when I heard that I had another class. It's great news. Um, it does start at 7.50 in the morning, so I don't know if that's going to suit any of your schedules. Plus, it's probably full. I haven't checked. But uh, that's, that's something that might be of interest to you. Anyway, this is the class key for the web assigned class we'll be using chapter 11 and chapter 12. We're both in the math, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. So, Sunday? Uh, the Sunday um, after the final. Okay. That's, that's when uh, I'll be assembling your grades. Anything submitted by then will be accepted. Okay. So, <coughs> to give us the equation x equals 2y squared, we want the focus, the directrix, and the focal diameter. Be careful here. P is, as Daniel researched for us, the focal parameter, not the focal diameter. The focal diameter is going to be 2P. So be careful about that. I'm sure you'll only get it wrong two or three times before you figure it out. We have a sign will tell you each time, so no worries. So in this case, if x is equal to 2y squared, How am I going to figure out P? I'm going to have to divide by 2 to get y squared by itself. So 1 half x is what y squared is equal to. It follows that 1 half is equal to what? 4P. Because the equation always says that y squared is equal to 4px. So yes, p is going to be 1 8 in this case. So where's the focus? 1 8 0. 1 8 0, because this is a horizontally oriented parabola. So it's going to offset that 1 8. What about the directors? 
Negative one eighth. Negative one x equals negative one eighth. I don't know whoever said I'll complain if you don't say x equals, but it should in this case, so it probably will. <laughs> Focal diameter. What's that going to be? One fourth. One fourth. If I'm interpreting the term correctly, it's not what I'm familiar with, I'm assuming that they're calling P effectively the focal radius in this case, so the focal diameter is all the way across from the directors to the focus. But I still don't understand why we need to find the focus. In this. <coughs> why we need to? Yes. Well, I mean, the short version is because I told you to. <laughs> but um, the utility of it is if you were designing a parabolic reflector for a headlight or something like that, you would need to know how far out to set the headlamp between the actual lighting element and the bowl behind it. So the focus would be how far I have to put that out. That's the focus. Right, the focus is where the actual bulb sits. And then the bowl behind it is the, uh, the parabola. So focal diameter is just half of whatever P is? Uh, twice whatever P is. How about the, the, the equix? Yeah, so you have the vertex. You go P in one direction, that's the focus. You go P in the other direction, that's the directors. What, why do we need it? Uh, there isn't a, a, a clear physical reason for that. In this case, it's just because you were asking. So, which of these graphs looks the most accurate? Bottom left. Bottom left. How would I have produced a graph like this? Yes, exactly. If the signs were opposite, that would reflect the parabola around the uh, y-axis in this case and produce the uh, opening to the left as opposed to the opening to the right piece here. Quick question. Hmm? Is the focus always the x-axis when you put it in the like, coordinate? Uh, no. It depends on the orientation. Oh, that's not the focus. Oh. Right. Let's Sorry. see if one is what they meant. No, that's not your fault. You didn't tell me that. You told me the vocal parameter. I'm just oh, it's my fault. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, 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 let's catch a phrase here, but uh, uh, huh. ask your teacher, professor. <laughs> Unfortunately, the buck stops here. Um, one sixteenth. Well, if it's not one eighth, then I just keep throwing numbers in the week. I mean, I, I, it might be one sixteenth, but that wouldn't make any sense. The focal diameter. Ah, the focal diameter is probably the distance across the curve at that point. Then. So it's four. So this is our parabola. The focus is here. I'm thinking this is probably the focal diameter. How do you even? Um, I mean, I turned the calculator. I got okay. not a possible parabola. I don't know if that's. Like, well, uh, I can't comment on your calculator, but I assure you it exists. Uh, so. <laughs> You know, that, that calculator may be a little suspect. <laughs> so we know that this is the point 180. We know that this is the curve y squared plus <coughs> one half x. So what do you think? You can, uh, you can input 180. Yes. I can figure out what these points are by plugging 1 8 in for x. It follows that y squared is equal to 1 half times 1 8, which is 1 16. If y squared is 1 16, y would be what? Plus or minus 1 over 2 squared x. Plus or minus what? 1 over 2 squared x. 1 over 4. 1 over 4. Oh, wrong with 1 plus. Oh, you, you think 256, right, okay. I thought you were saying something about x, and I was like, where'd the x come from? Okay, yes. So if this is the point 1, 8, 1, 4, and this is the point 1, 8, negative 1, 4, what's the diameter between them? Half. One half. Of this. Mm -hmm. I think you might want it as uh, um, x equals <laughs> the focal diameter? Yeah, because we're not going to that, or is it going to be 0.1? I'm pretty sure one half is going to be the correct answer. 
I mean, I looked, let's try. When I looked it up, I looked it up. It's one fourth up, but it's also one fourth down. So the diameter all the way across would be one half. So I looked it up. So that is yeah. yeah, I try to avoid the use of that word. So, y'all aren't quite old enough for me to be using that kind of language. <laughs> Do you just want to try to focus by P is important to you uh, on each one of them? It's not quite that simple. Because we have to take the square root of this product and then double the result of that. It, it, there is, I mean, you, you could derive a formula fairly easily that you could plug P into and it would tell you where the uh, focal diameter was. Um, and, you know, if we have... Oh, it's the focal width. That's right. Well, I, I don't know. So, if I have Y squared equals 4PX, the focus, the, the X value of the focus is going to be um, P. So that means Y squared it's going to equal 4p squared. Oh, so yeah, actually it is just uh, that simple. So yeah, if you take the square root of both sides, and then you find that y is equal to plus or minus 2p. So it is 4p. So that's what the focal diameter is? Yeah, the focal diameter is in fact 4p. Oh. Okay. Not for nothing. How do you think I figured that out? Chris, <laughs> we need to know that for the test, focal diameter. Well, of course. If it's on the homework, you might need to know for the test. Also, it's easy to find. If y squared equals 1 half x, the focal diameter is a half. So, if you find y equals plus minus 2p, how is the focal diameter 4p? What, what, what now? If you find y equals um, plus minus 2p. Ah, because the radius would be 2p in either direction. Right, so diameter the diameter is two of them together, yeah. Thank you. So is the focus whatever is not squared, if it makes sense? So if it's y squared equals a number x, the fo right. uh, focus would be whatever is it squared? Right. So the variable that's squared the focus is always going to have a zero in that coordinate. So since y was squared here, the focus has a zero in the y coordinate. But if x were squared, the focus would have a zero in the x coordinate. Um, I'm a little unclear about the distance between the focus and the parabola. Is it always the, because, how do you know it's the parabola? Well, it's always p. Yeah, but how do you know if it's one fourth away from the line of the parabola? Oh, you mean the y values? Yeah. Uh, because I calculated them here. So you can plug it in and that's where you get it? You can certainly do it that way. Um, in general, this distance is always going to be 2p. So doubling p. Yeah. Yeah. The x and y scales are certainly not equal. So, none of these are particularly difficult in terms of calculations. It's just a matter of multiplying by 4, dividing by 4, real simple stuff like that. So, once you get into the homework and, and get a little practice in, you'll find these really not that bad. And uh, so, yeah, go through the assignment for tomorrow. And tomorrow, I'll get into ellipses, which are not a lot more difficult. And probably get through hyperbolas tomorrow as well. And then we might get into shifted conic sections on Friday. All right, also, like I said, I will try to get the test graded for you tomorrow. I cannot make any promises. Uh, I will do my best to have a busy day today. Uh, if, you are, if you are headed toward a program in which you're gonna need a 4.0 GPA to get in, if your current test average is less than 90%, you might wanna think about taking the class pass fail. But uh, otherwise, don't worry about it, fine. All right. Anyway, I will uh, see you all tomorrow. Take your lunch. Have a good day. So when you say your current your current test average.
like right now, before you grade this test, like you know, right. Okay. Just don't do that. Let's say that I have had a test average of of, of ninety, uh, and I do. You probably reasonably expect that. To do that. Okay. <laughs> you are literally the reason you can't use that word. <laughs> I am. You are literally the reason. Yeah, actually, you were the one I was thinking. <laughs> 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 